to be able to be a part of this meeting and to see so many friendly faces. Some of you I know and some of you I don't, but I look forward to getting to know you better. Brother Mike was mentioning my ancestors, and as long as we're doing that, I have to give a shout out to my great-grandfather, who was a preacher. And so uh, his name was R.L., stood for Robert L., but it seemed like everybody went by their initials back then. Have you noticed that? And he actually, if, if the story is correct, he and my grandfather and I lived in the same dorm at Freed Hardeman. Now, I don't know if we lived in the same room, but I know that by the time I got there, the dorm did not smell very good anymore. And I also know that it was since basically gutted out and renovated. And for a while, I think it was turned into office space, but now it's dorms again. And so I guess it's theoretically possible that my son could live in that dorm one day. And he may not aspire to do that, but at any rate, it's, uh, it's interesting how there are family traditions like that. And my grandfather and my dad never pressured me to be a full-time preacher, but they did do that and set a good example and encourage me, and I appreciate that very much. Tonight we want to talk about hope, and we do need hope. We are in, invariably future-oriented creatures. We're always thinking about what we're going to do in the next minute or in the next hour or our plans for this coming week. Our life goals, if we want to put it more broadly and distant in the future. If I were to ask you, what are your future aspirations? What do you look to happen in your life? What do you anticipate or desire to happen in your future? I suppose you might list a number of things. We all have things on that list. Even if we haven't written them down, we may think, I'd like to go to college, or I would like to retire, or I would like to see my children get married and have children of their own and then be able to be with my grandchildren. And I would like to achieve this in my business. I would like to grow my business to this point. You might have a number of those goals. I wonder if the goals you would discuss, if I were to ask you a question like that about your future, I wonder if your goals would involve spiritual matters and going to heaven. Would you say things like, I would desire to be a more devoted Christian with a deeper prayer life, with a greater understanding of God's Word, with more eagerness for heaven, years down the road. Uh, I need to change. What do I need to change? It's on. Now it's on. I'm sorry. Here we go. Do I need to start over, or can you? Yeah. Surely you can hear all that. Just start okay. over. Just start over. <laughs> well, I think I think I won't start over. I, I think you, enough people can hear me that if you missed the, the previous three minutes of what I said, you can ask me after and just know that it was the greatest three minutes of speaking that anybody has ever done. No, just kidding. Okay, so what we're saying is we need to make sure as we make plans that our hope for heaven and our desire to grow closer to God through this life so that it will be natural for us to just go and be with the Lord after this life is over is the centerpiece of our lives. But just to illustrate how we are invariably and unavoidably future-oriented people, just consider a brief illustration. Suppose two men were hired to do exactly the same job, and suppose they're basically the same in every measurable way. They're from the same town, they're from the same socioeconomic status, they have similar family lives, and they're both hired to do the same job, which is a very boring, mundane, job. Not flashy at all. Let's just make it up something like putting a widget on a wadget. Putting part A onto part B. And that's the job that both of these men do all day long, every day. Eight hours a day, ten hours a day. And they're the same in every respect. Their work environment is the same. Same lighting, same lunchroom, same benefits. But let's say that man A is promised that at the end of the year he is going to be paid his salary for the year which will be ten thousand dollars but then let's say man b is promised that the salary at the end of his year of working is going to be ten million dollars do you suppose their outlook on their job would be appreciably different suppose they're meeting in the lunchroom one day and they don't know how much the other person has been promised in salary at the end of the year. They sit down to lunch 
at this factory. And the first one says, can you believe how tiresome this job is? It is so boring and so rote. And all we're doing is the same thing every day. And it's just so much. It's so difficult for me to even just put one foot in front of the other to come to work every day because it's so tedious. The next person, the one who's promised the $10 million at the end of the year, may say something like, well, I don't know, I find it pretty enjoyable. I kind of whistle when I come to work. It's pretty exciting to me. Well, what's the difference between these two workers? The answer is what they anticipate at the end of all of that work. It's their future hope, and that makes the difference. In this life, we all have to go through not just tedious things, but heartbreaking things. And life can be unimaginably hard. Sometimes I will see college students, maybe around Creed Hardeman, a lot of wonderful young people, or maybe I see young people in the youth group, and I have eager anticipation for what they may do for the Lord in the future, and I think about what awesome servants they can be, how many people they can convert, the mission work they can do, the contribution they can make to the kingdom. I see all that, but then I also think to myself, life might turn out to be a lot harder for them than they realize. And you may be able to sympathize with that thought even more because some of the challenges you face are probably far greater than the challenges that I've faced. And some of us go through such tribulation. Remember, Paul said to those young Christians in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So if we're going to go to heaven, it will be through many trials, many temptations. I want to read you a statement by Andrew Del Banco, who is a social commentator from Columbia University in New York. And notice what he says in his book titled, Hope, the American Dream. And he's talking about how hope of some future goals for society has inspired Americans over the centuries. And here's what he said. We must imagine some end to life that transcends our own tiny allotment of days and hours if we are to keep at bay the dim, back-of-the-mind suspicion that one may be adrift in an absurd world or a meaningless existence, the name for that suspicion, for the absence or diminution of hope, is melancholy, the lurking suspicion that all our getting and spending amounts to nothing more than fidgeting while we wait for death. That is a bleak outlook isn't it? That this life with all of its troubles and tedium is just fidgeting, waiting for death. And not just our death, but the death of the solar system itself. If atheism is true, and if there's no heaven to which we can look forward after this life is over, then our situation is, we have just a few years on this planet, and then we die. And then a few, read that as maybe a million, maybe several million years after this, the universe itself will either burn up from overheating or freeze out. And either way, whether it's a heat death or a freezing death of the universe, and scientists aren't really sure, last I checked, the universe is just going to fizzle out. It will just dissolve into nothingness, and there will be literally nothing. So fidgeting while we wait for death would be about all there is. There's no ultimate meaning to life. Because not only will there be no further existence for us, but there will be no further existence for the world we inhabit and which we hope to impact in some way. We might go to a wedding ceremony for some young people who are starting their lives together. And I remember Rebecca's and my wedding and all of the faces of the loved ones we saw in the audience that day, looking out over all those people and thinking about the contributions they had made and the difference that they have made in our lives and being so thankful for the sacrifices that those people have made in our behalf. You've had similar experiences, I suppose. But if atheism is true, then we're all just going to die and we'll see all of our loved ones die or we will die. Think about the family table, husband and wife, mom and dad, the kids sitting around. It's a pretty bleak thought. I don't mean to be melodramatic or overly negative, but one of those people will see the rest of them die. They'll go to the funerals for the others if they don't all die at the same time. It's a bleak picture. If, as Solomon said, all we have is what's under the sun, remember the book of Ecclesiastes, 
then all is vanity. Everything, all of our toiling, just our fidgeting, all of our working and building gardens like he did and getting education and developing a kingdom and indulging in the pleasures of wine, women, and song, everything that Solomon tried in order to make himself fully satisfied without God, under the sun, with just a secular outlook, with a no-God outlook, produced vanity and striving after the wind. It doesn't produce ultimate satisfaction. It doesn't provide hope. Y'all are familiar with The Lion King, I suggest. And, you know, there's a, a part in The Lion King where Simba, the future king of the, of the pride, is talking to his dad, Mufasa, who's the great king of all the lions in the pride. I, you know about it. I don't have to tell you who the characters are. You know who the characters are in The Lion King. If not, you probably don't have little kids or, or little grandkids. So anyway, if you don't know it, you can look it up later. But anyway, Simba's asking about the, the future of the Lion King. And Mufasa explains that all the lions die and go back into the dirt, and they become food for the other animals. And then those other animals die, and they become food for future animals. So everybody is just food for all of the other animals. You see, and it's the great circle of life. That's the big song. And the circle of life means you die and you're eaten by somebody else. Just food for the worms. That's a depressing thought if that's all there is. I'm trying to say we need something else. Amen. We need something to provide us with a hope. Something to look forward to. And the Bible provides the answer for all this. Ever since the Enlightenment, people have been trying to answer questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going without the Bible? Without God? And the fruit of it is all of the anxiety and depression and discouragement and strife that we perceive in the world today. Because people are not looking forward to a hope and preparing their lives, orienting their lives around obtaining that hope at the end of their lives. So tonight, let's revel for a little bit in the hope of glory that each of us has if we are Christians. So we want to do it in four steps. First, we're going to say, what is the definition of the Christian hope that endures? This lesson is called A Hope That Endures. When I talk about enduring, what I'm talking about is keeping us confident, keeping us contented as life goes on no matter what happens. We don't mean that hope will exist literally forever because hope will be fulfilled when we go to heaven. We will get what we hope for, so we won't hope anymore. Similarly, we won't need faith anymore because we, faith will turn to sight. And we will no longer believe without seeing. We will just see. There will continue to be love. And that's one of the reasons why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that faith and hope and love abide in these three. But the greatest of these is what? The greatest of these is love. So when we go to heaven, we won't need faith and hope anymore. But we will still hold on to love. And that's part of why heaven is so wonderful. So when I say enduring... I'm talking about keeping us close to God through this life and being strengthened as we go so we can be ready to go to heaven. That's the Christian hope. So the definition of the hope, then the object of the hope, and then the guarantee of the hope, and then the impact of the hope. And that sounds like a lot, but it won't take very long to do each one of these. So I'll make the first point very brief so that you'll have hope that the lesson will not be internal. Okay? <laughs> so number one, number one, the definition. The biblical definition of hope, and this word occurs 85 times in the New Testament, is the Greek word elpis. I think I even have the Greek letters on the screen for you there, elpis. And it means looking forward to something with some reason for confidence respecting fulfillment. That sounds a little bit more complicated than it really is. All it means is confident expectation. Desire for something with reason to believe that you will be able to get it. Let's just illustrate it a couple of ways. If there is someone sick in the hospital and you go to see about that person because you love the person, you walk in the room and you see that the doctor's there, you may have a question for the doctor. Namely, is there any hope? Well, the English word hope doesn't serve us terribly well because often when we use that word hope, we mean a wish. But when you ask the doctor, what, is there any hope? You're not saying, is there any wish? What you're saying is, is there any reason to believe that our desire will be fulfilled? Namely, that the person get better. 
The doctor wishes the person gets better. You wish the person gets better. But your question is, do we have any reason to believe that the person will get better? In other words, do we have hope about it? A person might say, I, I hope I get a million dollars. But that's not biblical hope. That's a wish. You see the difference? He may not have any reason to believe in the world that he's going to get a million dollars. He just says, I hope I get it. What he means is, I wish. But the biblical idea of hope is not just a wish. It's a wish accompanied with confidence that what we desire will be fulfilled. Another illustration. Suppose we have a little boy who wakes up on a Saturday morning, no school. And he looks out the window of his bedroom and he sees a beautiful, sunny West Tennessee, or a, what, a south, a south east Missouri day. Yeah. And he, because he's young, he doesn't even think about allergies. So he's thinking about what a beautiful day this is. And he has eager, confident expectation that he's going to be able to go out and enjoy it. He sees his swing set. He sees his little puppy dog to play with. He sees his bicycle out there that he can ride. And because there's nothing inhibiting him from going out there and enjoying the day, he's not grounded or anything, and his parents are perfectly happy for him to go out and play, gets him out of their hair for a little while. So he says, I am hoping, I have hope, I have confidence that I'm going to be able to go out and enjoy that day. But on the other hand, if that same little boy wakes up on a Saturday and finds that he's sick and his parents aren't going to let him go out and play, or he finds as he wakes up, he remembers that he had broken the rules last week and he's grounded and he's not going to be able to go outside. He may wish, but does he have any hope? He does not have any hope that he's going to go out and play. He just has a desire. Maybe your mom or dad left to go on a trip sometime when you were a little kid. They were going to come back in a few days and you said, Mom or Dad, will you bring me something? I asked that a lot of times. Anytime Dad was going to preach somewhere and I wasn't going with him, which often I did, but if I wasn't going with him, I always wanted him to bring me something. And if he said he would, then what did I have? I had hope because he said he would. Now, if he had said, no, I might still have a desire, I might have a wish, but I wouldn't have hope. And 1 John 5, 13 says, that he was writing, John was writing to those Christians in the first century so that they may know that they had eternal life. So that they may have confident expectation. And we have a desire, but we also have a reason to believe that that desire can be fulfilled. I want to read you a statement from Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist who was imprisoned in Auschwitz. And he was a psychologist, so he could not turn off his analysis of human nature while he was in prison there. He survived the war and then wrote a famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he discusses his experience watching people deal with the horrors of being in a Nazi prison death camp during World War II. And he says that people responded to that horror in about three different ways. Notice what he says. Some became brutal and cruel to them, uh, became brutal and cruel themselves. Just like the Nazis were brutal and cruel, some prisoners turned to act that way. He said, in the bitter fight for self-preservation, he, that is the prisoner, may forget his human dignity and become no more than an animal. Some people responded that way. Then some people responded by giving up. Notice Frankel said, the prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hope. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis, the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. We all feared this moment, not for ourselves, which would have been pointless, but for our friends. Usually it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed and wash or go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. And that would result, as Frankel describes, in insanity or death. But then, in the third place, there were those in Auschwitz, in the prison camps, who held on to hope for the future. Notice how Professor Frankel described them. Many held on through the hope that if they stayed alive, their health 
family, professional achievements, fortune, position in society, those things that happened their hope would be restored. But after liberation, so many found that when the day of their dreams had finally come, it was much different than what they longed for. Many people went into deep depression for the rest of their lives after their liberation or even committed suicide. So many of us said to ourselves in the camp to one another that no earthly happiness could compensate us for everything we had suffered. And yet afterward, we were not prepared for the disillusionment. Life in a concentration camp tore open the human soul and exposed its depths. Those concentration camps were a stripping away of all of the fineries and fun things and comfortable things in life all at once. Your family, your health, all of warm relationships that you would enjoy, they were all stripped away at once. And that's a shock. It was difficult for people to respond. The ones who could survive to the end were the ones who could hold on to something that might preserve them. And even then, they were disillusioned when it's over. I bring up the prison camps because they instantly stripped away what will be stripped away from all of us. Everything that the prison camps took away will eventually be taken away from all of us. I hope it's in a slower way. I hope it's in a more painless way. I hope that we're not literally in prison. But this life will take away, eventually, all of the comforts of life. Because we are proceeding toward death. What do we anticipate after? Do you have something to hold on to? After all of those comforts and pleasures, things that you might hang all of your hopes on right now if you're not thinking in a Christian way, things that you might think could provide you ultimate satisfaction right now, if you're holding on to them, money, fame, sports, family, all other kinds of social engagement, if you think that's where your ultimate satisfaction is, I'm here to tell you, this is a bleak thing to say, but all of that's going to be stripped away. What do you have to hold on to after that? And Hebrews 6.19 says, Our hope in Christ is an anchor for the soul, so that no matter what comes, we have something that will keep us going. We have confident expectation in what will happen in the next world. So there's the object of our, the definition of our hope, but let's think a little bit more about the object of our hope. And that is, to put it in one word, and you can use other words for this, glory. Our passage here is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 7, where the Apostle Paul said, God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in John 17, 24, Jesus prayed that his disciples could see the glory that Jesus had with the Father. And that was glory that he had before the world had begun. To go to heaven, to be with Jesus, what a remarkable experience. I, we can't describe it. We can't put it into words. I'd like to be able to give you a, a, a rich, full description of heaven. We get some insights in the Bible about what it will be like. Some facts that I can share with you tonight is that we will be with Jesus. One of those, the most precious one, I suppose, is that we'll be with the Lord himself. Paul said in Philippians 1.23, that his desire was to depart and be with Christ. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, talking about our physical bodies being like a tabernacle that we will take off when we die. Our bodies will no longer be a suitable habitat for our souls. And so our souls will depart and we will not be unclothed or naked, but we will have a house in the heavens. A building not made with hands. A building made by God. Hebrews 11 and verse 16 says that people like Abraham, those heroes of faith, were seeking a country that was made by God. A country that God has constructed. Just like Jesus said in John 14 that he had gone to prepare a place or was going to prepare a place for his children, for his apostles and those who would follow after their teachings. A place where there will be no sickness or suffering or death because God has wiped away every tear from the eyes of those who have trusted in him. Revelation 21.4. A place that's incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. It's a living hope. 
Peter says in that context. It continues to live despite all of the darkness and death that we see around us. And despite all of the times that we think the devil is going to just overwhelm this world in so many quarters, our hope our, for the future remains. And it is a glorious hope. There is no higher station. There is no more blessed existence that a person could achieve than to be around the throne of God, praising Him forever and ever, and enjoying the fellowship of the saints. Like Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11 says, that we sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A place where we don't have to worry about sin anymore. No temptation will threaten us there because nothing evil ever enters it. Nobody can ever cause you to sin anymore, and you never have to worry about people sinning against you because nothing impure ever enters there. Just a place where everything is just the way you want it to be. And some people say it's hard for them to think about wanting that. I have a hard time seeing that. People say, well, think about the benefits of this world. This world is so good. Why would you want to focus on the next world? I just don't think they really understood what the Bible says about how great heaven is going to be. Amen, bro. And some people actually say that God is going to just reconstitute this physical world and just kind of fix up this physical world. That doctrine just shows a, a pale comparison to what heaven will actually be like. It's not going to be Amen. a fixed up planet Earth. It's going to be so much better than that. Amen. It's not going to be like Garden of Eden all over again. It's going to be better than the Garden of Eden ever was because in the Garden of Eden there was temptation. But there's no temptation in heaven. There is only all of our desires satisfied. And maybe you might think, well, maybe he heaven sounds pretty good, but I think I can probably eventually, I make a little more money, get a little more comfortable, have a little more peace in my life, get a good therapist, I can <laughs> probably have most of the satisfaction that I want in this life. I'm not really going to worry about the next life. I don't think a person who says something like that has really thought about his deepest desires that much. Or maybe he's repressed them, and he's not thinking about what his deepest desires really are. His deepest desires would include things like, if, if he's being honest with himself, I think your deepest desires would include having no conflict with anybody ever again. Never having to have a difficult conversation where you bring up a problem in your relationship ever again. Never having to be disappointed by how badly somebody behaved ever again. I think your deepest desires would involve never having to be sick. Never having to worry about going to the doctor. I think your deepest desires would be being reunited with your dead loved ones. I would imagine your deepest desires would include loving somebody and never having to be parted from that person ever again. It's been said that the surest way to hurt yourself is to fall in love with somebody because eventually you're going to have to be parted from that person one way or the other. And I, that's just true that we do surrender the possibility of our being in pain. We open ourselves up to a lot of pain when we love somebody. But in heaven, we'll love all of those blessed people so much and our Lord and Savior and we'll never have to part. No more goodbyes. Just think about the deepest desires of your heart and then realize you get it all if you go to heaven. Notice what C.S. Lewis said about this matter. C.S. Lewis was not a member of the Lord's Church, but he said a lot of very helpful things, especially on the subject of hope. And here's what he said to try to help people understand why we really need the hope of heaven, especially secular people who associate the idea of heaven with ghosts and things that are just not scientific and they say there's no evidence for heaven and so we need to base our our hope on the here and now on earth and here's what c.s lewis said most people if they could really learn to look into their own hearts would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world there are all sorts of things that this world in this world that offer to give it to you but they never quite keep their promise the longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. I am not now speaking of what would ordinarily be called unsuccessful marriages or holidays or learned careers. I am speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we have grasped at 
in that first moment of longing, which just fades away in the reality. I think everyone knows what I mean. The spouse may be a good spouse, and the hotels and scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may have been a very interesting job, but something has evaded us. Preachers are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger? Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim? Well, there is such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Keep seeking those things above, in that other world where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Well, that is the object of our hope. But now what is the guarantee of our hope? We need to hasten toward the end. The guarantee. It's a threefold guarantee, biblically speaking. We have the promises of God, which are always kept. Even our own context that we started with in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. So if God promises that you can go to heaven based on the terms in the scriptures, then you can go. He's going to keep his word. He always fulfills what he says. He's not a man that he should lie in Numbers 23, 19. And then the second facet of the guarantee for our hope is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Not only did God say, you can be risen from the dead and go to heaven, your body reunited with your soul, your body changed, reunited with your soul, and going immortally into heaven, but then Jesus conquered the grave himself. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul said that Jesus is the first fruits from the grave. You know what first fruits are. When there's a harvest, the farmer will bring in an initial sample of what the rest of the harvest will be like. And he'll say, look at this corn, look at this wheat, look at this fruit, and see that the rest of the harvest is going to be great just like this. So it's a sample, it's a first fruit. It's a sort of evidence that there will be subsequent like this. And Jesus, Paul says, is the first fruits from the grave, showing that if he, by God's power, conquered the grave, then likewise we will be able to do it. So we've seen evidence that it can take place. And I wish I had enough time tonight to develop the evidences for the resurrection for the dead. But let me tell you this, just in short, and Brother Mike will give you evidence for the resurrection another time. I'm sure he already has. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the best attested fact of antiquity. There has never been an event in all of the ancient world that had as much evidence supporting its historicity than the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Right. And if he resurrected from the dead, then we can be assured that we will do it as well. So you will go to heaven, and you will be you, and I will be me, and we can reintroduce ourselves to one another there. And then the third aspect of the guarantee for our hope is the love of God. Because God is going to give us all things, given that he already gave us his son. That's Paul's argument in Romans 8, 31. Paul says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up to die for us, how will he not also with him give us all things? See, God gave Jesus to be crucified. Paul says, if, he, if God gave you Jesus, if he gave his own son for you, then don't you think he will give you heaven too? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. It's very similar to the argument God made with Abraham in Genesis 22, where he said that he knew that Abraham would sacrifice anything to him because he had already been willing to give what? To give his son. Abraham showed that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, and God says at the end of that process, now I know that you will be faithful to me, you will give me anything, because I asked for your son, your only son, whom you love, and you gave it. Well, if that's the case, then couldn't we still say about God, who is so much greater than Abraham, he gave us his son. He was willing to sacrifice of himself. Will he not give us heaven as well? Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Well, think about that. Jesus became sin, not that he became a sinner himself or became guilty of sin, but he bore the penalty for our sins. What an incredible gift for the guilt of our sins to be imputed to Jesus on that occasion so that we could go to heaven. God wants to give us heaven, and he showed that 
by the sacrifice of his son on the cross. So we have, we have his word on the matter, his promise. We have the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, giving us an example of how it can work. And then we have the love of God as shown in the sacrifice of Jesus. I suggest to you there is no stronger guarantee of our hope in heaven, of our confidence that we can go there and be with him. Now finally, before we extend the invitation, the impact of our hope. How does our confidence in heaven affect the way that we live? Well, for that, I would like for us to look in our Bibles at Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1, 1 and 2, and then we will have a few words to wrap up. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we, notice this, exult in the hope of the glory of God. We exult. We rejoice in it. And if our lives are not characterized by rejoicing, then maybe we're not thinking about heaven enough. Amen. And if daily struggles, daily mishaps, setbacks, pains, cause us to be really down, for long periods of time, not saying that we don't struggle with having tough times, not saying that life is easy, but if life gets us to where we're not rejoicing in our hope, then we need to reevaluate our confidence in heaven. And of course, there can be chemical imbalances that need to be treated. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about chemical depression that needs to be treated. I'm talking about a refusal to obey Philippians 4.4, which says to rejoice evermore. If we're not exulting in the hope of glory, as Paul says in this passage, maybe we don't appreciate our justification the way we should. Maybe we're not reading the Bible about our salvation enough to really feed on it. We're not giving enough fuel to the fire of our rejoicing because we don't study enough about our reason to rejoice. Children are sometimes better than adults at thinking about heaven and being more realistic about the possibility of going to heaven. I was talking to my little boy Ellis the other night. I was changing his diaper. I probably shouldn't tell you that part. But I was changing his diaper. And he was talking to me about when is Jesus going to come back? Because we had just been talking about the judgment day when Jesus would come back and take us to heaven. And I think Ellis had gotten the idea that it was going to be maybe tonight. It could be the next day. So he wanted to know when. And I told him, I said, it could be any time, but we don't know when. And I explained, I said, the Bible doesn't say when. And he repeated back to me. He said, the Bible doesn't say when. And then we were at services in North Jackson a day or two later, maybe Wednesday night. And he just said to somebody, he, he said something to the effect of, Jesus is coming back, but the Bible doesn't say when. And the, the person kind of said, yes, I know. Uh, I'm aware of that. But you see, it was on his mind. And, of course, he doesn't understand what that means. He's, he thought that, I think he thinks that Jesus is coming to our house, that he's just going to show up and walk in the front door. And Revelation 3.20 does say he stands at the door and knocks, but I don't think that's what it means. Anyway, yeah, I think he had the idea that Jesus was going to come over and eat with us. But I just say that to suggest that the return of Jesus to take us to heaven was, was real in some way in a child's mind. He was really thinking about Jesus coming and seeing him. And I suppose throwing his arms around him. And I wonder if we think in realistic terms like that. We should. Because it's going to happen. We may not be here to see it, but if, if 1 Thessalonians 4 is correct, then if we are not dead, we'll go and be with and meet him in the air, those who are still living. And if we've died, we will be resurrected, and we will go meet him in the air, uh, we will go first. But anyway, there was a, a journal in the Brotherhood that ran an article not too long ago where some children were asked in their Bible class where they wanted to be when Jesus came back. And I thought their answers were, were really sweet. One little boy in the class, these were about five-year-olds, one said, I'd like to be at church. That's a good answer. We'd like to be singing Amazing Grace when Jesus comes back. Although it doesn't matter where we are, if we're faithful, we can be out fishing. 
and it wouldn't, wouldn't matter. We don't want to be forsaking the assembly, of course, that we don't want to be sinning. But I mean, it doesn't matter if you're at work or if you're at school or if you're at play or if you're in the assembly. It won't matter when Jesus comes back. Every eye will see him, Revelation 1 says, and we'll be judged based upon the lives that we've lived. But the little boy said, I'd like to be in church. And another little girl talked about wanting to be with her mom and dad. They gave various answers. But then one little boy said, I would like to be beside the grave of my grandmother because I would like to be the first one to see her when she comes up out of the grave. See, it was real to him. He was thinking about what a day that would be. And then one of them said, I would like to be beside the bedside of Sister Ford. And Sister Ford was one of the elders' wives. He said, I would like to be by her bedside. And she was not well. She was comatose. She was ill. But he wanted to get to see her as she had been. He wanted to get to see her old personality before she had all her ailments. And he knew that when Jesus would come back, he would fix all that. And so the thought of getting to be in such a blessing in that state just radiated with him. He, he really felt that. One more thing, and then we'll extend the invitation. Emily was a little girl who was about five years old, and she had a grave illness, and doctors told her and her family that she did not have long to live. And that made her sad because she loved her family. She didn't want to be separated from her family, but her parents had explained to her that we're going to go to heaven, you're, you're going to go to heaven, and then we'll come and be with you. But she was having a hard time picturing that. And I don't know if this was the best way to handle it, but it seems pretty good to me. They told Emily to go into her bedroom and just wait just a minute. And they closed the door behind her so she was alone in her bedroom. And then one of them would open the door and come in and then close the door behind them. And they did that one by one. One person in her family came in and then closed the door. And then the next person opened the door and came in and then closed the door until the whole family was in there in that room with Emily. And they said, that's what heaven is going to be like. That you will go on and be in heaven, and then we will come in one by one unless we die at the same time. We will come in and we will be with you in heaven. That's a pretty good way to illustrate it to a five-year-old. But, of course, we might like to tweak that. We might like to say it would be better if there was somebody in the room to meet her. Somebody a lot like Jesus. Somebody who is kind and sweet to say, I'm going to take care of you from now on. And you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and now you're here with me, and you have nothing to worry about. That would be nice. It would be nice to add to the illustration that she doesn't have to have her sickness anymore. No more treatments, no more hospital beds, no more hospice. No more doctors, no more drugs, no more anything but just perfect health. No struggles at all. That would be nice. But of course we can't achieve that with an illustration on this earth because this earth is not our final abode. This is, we were designed for another world. Did C.S. Lewis say in the statement we read, a duck wants to swim, there's such a thing as water. A baby wants to eat. There's such a thing as food. And if we find in ourselves a desire for something that we cannot have in this world, we cannot have what heaven offers in this world, then in all likelihood, and the Bible confirms it, we were made for another world. Don't you want to go there? Amen. This world is not our home, and we're just passing through. I look forward to being there with you. But if you have not made preparation for it, then you need to tonight. Is there really any choice to be made? The choice between heaven and hell? We didn't even talk about hell. But if heaven is so great, why would you ever pick hell? Why would you choose to be alienated from the Lord and his people for eternity? Surely you don't want to do that. Repent of your sins, confess the Lord, be immersed in the water for the forgiveness of your sins, or be restored if you need to be, or ask for the prayers of the church if we can support you. I know that this good congregation wants to do anything in its power to assist you on your way to heaven. Come now. As together we stand and while we sing.